Hello and welcome back to Catch and Cook California. I'm Kevin and today we're going to do a little bit of a unconventional video. Um, over the last year and a half I've amassed all this crazy footage of crazy adventures. I just didn't have any time to edit while I was finishing my PhD. So now that I'm done and I'm Dr. Kev, <laughs> now I can share this footage with you. So let's start off. We got some some spear fishing with bone tipped harpoons followed up with some bow fishing. We got some uh, some crawdadding, we've got some rabbit hunting, free diving for Dungeness crab, all kinds of good stuff. So let's go. So you were down at the river the other day. <laughs> Trying to spare a cop. <laughs> um, okay, so update. Uh, yesterday, um, it got really windy toward the end of the day and it made the water super cloudy. So all the fish seemed to, I don't know, dive down. Dive we got down. a couple shots. But... It was hot too, so I think, I think they're going down to cooler water. Also like lower down, but. So we're back out, but we're at a, a different spot. This is a location that I missed a shot at a 30 pounder like a week ago. So we're gonna keep trying. We're gonna try. So I'm just going to voice over a lot of this older footage, uh, kind of fill you in on the details. I don't know if you can see these carp just jumping like crazy out there. Some of these are 20 or 30 pounds. Annual fishing license. Make sure you have this on you. So Martin and I waded out into the muck, in with the leeches, once again. <laughs> And uh, you got to be really quiet, you got to move really slowly because these fish can sense any kind of vibration in the water. And uh, you know, it's a slow moving body of water, so if you step on a stick and it snaps, you'll just feel these massive fish just explode all around you, they just take off. And uh, yeah, like I said, some of these are 20 or 30 pounds, so you really feel it in the water. So anyway, we we're just stealthily kind of cruising along and you know, missing a lot. But uh, getting some decent shots. Oh yeah, here comes one. The frustration! <laughs> oh yeah, there was a lot of that, but it was super fun. Um, and these harpoon tips made from deer bone, they seem to hold up pretty well. And uh, you know, getting shot after shot, even though we were missing a lot, we were just all smiles like the whole day. It was so much fun. And this was multiple days you know we went out there you'll see my shirt changes colors it's because we kept going oh yeah check this one out boom you see it move through the it's moving through the weeds there that's a big fish a lot of times that's what would happen here's one underwater check this out <laughs> and then he, he saw me and blasted on out of there <laughs> the frustration yeah these are huge fish though um and and super fun to hunt um but yeah, we just kept trying and trying and trying and trying. And uh, like I said, you gotta move really, really slow and then maybe you'll get a shot. And that's usually a miss. <laughs> Here's Martin getting ready and the fish gives him the slip. <laughs> and another shot. <laughs> and another miss. <laughs> and another shot. Oh man, we were getting so close. <laughs> I can't believe I missed that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Um, in this game, you get no prize for second place. <laughs> anyway, I finally got a scale. I actually grazed one of these fish and I got a scale on the tip of the, uh, the harpoon there. You can see it. I'll hold it up here. Check that out. The struggle was real, <laughs> but we didn't give up. We came back strong and, uh, I decided, you know, even though freshwater spear fishing season ended, that didn't apply to bow fishing. So here we go. So I headed out to a new location and I was walking the, the edge of this creek. I don't know if you can see that dark shape there. That's a, a decent sized carp kind of on the edge of this creek. So I had to, you know, stealthily string my bow, get everything ready disentangle my shooting line and uh, I started off with an obsidian point and as you'll see I hit it here and the fish exploded and broke the obsidian point but luckily I think it got hit so hard 
You can see the blood in the water. Um, it stayed in the shallows. It didn't take off. And so I think it was just bleeding out. So I was able to creep in really close for a second shot. Bam! Uh, that's what we call a stone shot. I hit it right in the spine. It didn't even kick its tail or anything. It just, that was it. But, uh, kind of anticlimactic at the end there, but... There it is, guys. Bam! Well, I'll tell you, I really expected that thing to just thrash all over the place and run like heck, and I was going to have to drag it in. And instead, after all that time, I just hit it right in the spine. He was stone dead. We, we call that a stone shot in, uh, in free dive spear fishing. I, I guess it's called the same thing with bow fishing, but I'm new to this whole bow fishing thing. Anyway, that is a beautiful carp. It's probably only, I don't know, three pounds or so, but um, should be perfect for eating. Now, these guys have a reputation as a, quote, trash fish in the U.S., but in many parts of the world, they're considered a game fish. That's why they were originally introduced from Europe. So I think we're going to have to give it a taste test. The recipe looks amazing, so we'll see about the fish. We know it's gonna have a ton of bones. That's we already are well aware of that. But how's the flavor? That's what I want to know. There we go. How do you know if it's cooked? Hmm, it's totally cooked. Hmm, there's a bone. You see that? That's a live bone. These guys are notorious for these. It makes them really, really hard to fillet. That and those crazy rib bones. Those things were like quarter inch thick. And on a 20 pound salmon, they're like 16th inch thick. So this guy's got some serious rib bones. What do you think of the flavor? The flavor is good. Um, yeah. I would probably braise it even longer next time. To, to get it a little more crispy? Or, no, to let it penetrate but it's really yummy. It's totally good. Mm -hmm. The skin's good. Always. Like, Fish skin is always good. But this one's like nice and thick. Kind of like chewy, but not like, not in a bad way. Maybe it's a little hard to pull off in one piece, but <laughs> that's a lucky piece right there. This is good. So I've had carp one other time um, in India in a curry and it was also really really good but i do remember it was a lot of work lots of bones i will totally eat this again that's good and that's not me like as as novice like guy who doesn't fish i've been fishing since i could stand on my own two feet and i've always heard terrible things about this fish and that is a good fish it's just bony and it'll break your filleting knife <laughs> I was seriously surprised at how good that carp was. Very, very bony, but I knew that going into it, but the flavor was actually quite good. I, I know, surprising, but it was. So then what happened? Um, oh yeah, yeah. so uh, the last video I dropped before my year-long hiatus, I think I left a little comment in there that said something like, part two, rabbit hunt coming soon. <laughs> well, 
a year later, I guess is soon. <laughs> anyway, um, here's a little footage from the rest of that day uh, that Diane and I were doing our tin can hobo fishing. Um, we ended up getting a rabbit and then my buddy Luke and I went out for crayfish the following day and we got a bunch of crayfish, swamp lobsters, crawdads, whatever you want to call them and uh, made an amazing wild rabbit crawdad Vietnamese boon bowl. Check this out. So when I'm walking, I'll keep my finger right here. When I see a rabbit and I know it's clear, I'll keep my finger right here on the safety. It's not pushed in, that's fire, that's safe. I'll keep it on the safety. I'll also keep the gun just kind of sitting like this, rather than just holding it off to one side because if a rabbit pops up and starts running, you need to be ready to go. So I'll just keep it kind of relaxed like so, so that it's real quick to come up. As I'm coming up, I get it locked, safety comes off. Some people, safety's back on now. Some people will walk around with the safety off saying, well, you know, it just takes too long to, to take the safety off. I swear if you come hunting with me or any of my buddies and you walk around without your safety on or with your finger on your trigger, or if you do anything else that we deem unsafe, you will never hunt with us again. This is a serious tool. It's a tool to bring food to the table. But it's lethal, it's designed to kill, and you need to treat it accordingly. Got my rabbit, pretty stoked. Um, I only needed one today, so yeah, I don't even think I'm gonna shoot another one if I see it. I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure it's unloaded. So there you can see, chamber's open. There's nothing in it. So if I'm walking toward a vehicle and there's somebody getting out of a vehicle to come into an area to hunt, I usually leave my chamber open and I'll just keep it like this as I'm walking by. That way for sure they know it's not loaded. Um, if they're walking on my left, I'll switch it and cradle it to the right. You notice the way I'm holding it, my finger is not on the trigger. So cradling it is a good way to walk. Some people will do this as they walk, but as I learned years ago in the hunter safety course, that is really likely to start to turn into this. And then if somebody's behind you, that's super dangerous. So when I walk, I'll typically walk with it on my hip like so. I know it's pointed to the sky in a safe direction, or I will walk with it pointed down like this, or if somebody's next to me, Let's say Martin's on my right, then I'll walk with it cradled, pointed toward the left. That way it's still left and up, not left and straight out. So if it goes off, it's going to shower down some shot like, you know, 300 yards away, 200 yards away, and shot raining down on you just feels like somebody threw a bunch of frozen peas at you. It doesn't hurt or anything. But shot blast straight to the face, that'll hurt if you're lucky enough to feel it. It'll probably just kill you. So, gun safety, extremely important. I know for sure this is unloaded, and yet, when I get to the vehicle, I will again pull back the pump, open up the chamber, make sure it's absolutely unloaded before I put it back in my case, put a lock on it, etc. Anyway, let's go make some rabbit. But first things first, the crayfish hunt. Chensi style. <laughs> we picked this up from our buddy Chensi, fishing chef, the colander and the stick method. It works really well. <laughs> yeah, I am 100% all about the colander and the stick method. Dude. Thanks, Chensi. Oh, <laughs> well, is it his idea? Yeah, I saw him do it with a butterfly net and a stick one time. And I was like, there's no way. And he just loads up and I'm like, yeah. it's so simple, it's brilliant. Right. <laughs> That's a nice one, dude. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grumpy man. <laughs> Dude, 
dude, nice haul, man. Thanks, man. <laughs> there's gotta be like 40 in there. There's a lot, and there's some big, some big boys in here. <laughs> yeah. Nice, man. So we should also note these are the Louisiana crayfish. This is a non-native species. Got those big, bumpy kind of red claws. And uh, so the Department of Fish and Wildlife wants you to eat every single one of these that you catch. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. <laughs> the other thing is with these, since they're non-native invasives, once you've caught them, it's illegal to release them or put them back into the water. So you gotta eat them or kill them. You can't put them back. Not too shabby for a colander in a stick. so stoked. We've been wanting to do this for like a year now. Diane just made this sauce. Mmm. The classic boom sauce. Bing. Mm. Oh yeah. Mmm. So tender. The, the texture is great. Mm -hmm. And that sauce is bomb. It's got a nice little zing. Mmm. Twitter bay. Twitter what? Um, it's a new... YouTube kind of cooking thing, this cooking channel that I've been following. It's called what now? Tueda Bay. Tueda Bay. Sweet. It's delicious. From scratch, Diane made the sauce and the egg rolls and then the rabbit. So jackrabbit is notoriously tough or stringy. So we were talking and I was thinking, you know, like, Growing up, we would go after abalone, and abalone is tough as nails until you pound it. We were talking, and Diane's like, yeah, there's no reason you can't pound out rabbit and make it tender, so that's what we're trying. I've never heard of anybody doing this, so maybe it'll be good, but uh, you never know until you try. And then, of course, we got our swamp lobster skewers. Bam! Got some cucumber in here, some Thai basil, some mint. The uh, special sauce, bean sprouts, spring rolls, green onion, crawdad, and rabbit. I'm going to give a rabbit a little taste here. I want to try the rabbit too. Mmm, the flavor's good. The flavor's good. It's a little dry. A little bit dry. Kind of tastes... <laughs> it's salty. That one kind of tastes like rabbit jerky if yeah. I've ever had one. Yeah. So I cooked it a little extra long because it is wild rabbit and it needs to be cooked. But yeah, it's got like a jerky thing going on. It's really salty. I think it could have come out of that brine a little earlier. But it's still good. Alright, I'm going to have this with the rest of it and see how that is. That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Dang that spice. Mm-hmm. I feel like I need mm. a little more. Mm-hmm. Do you need a little more? Oh yeah. Load me up, baby. Yeah. It's got good heat. Even more? Mm-hmm. Perfect. Thank you, dear. Yeah. Normally when I'm at Viet Vietnamese places, I end up putting a little sriracha or something on there, but those two Thai chilies really did it. <laughs> That's awesome. Mmm. Mmm. What? The flavor's on point. Thai basil, mint, the sauce. Mmm. And then we got the egg roll. 
I know the egg roll's mm. good. Mm. Dude. Heck yeah. The sauce is good. Everything is delicious. I think it's a success. Well, that was one heck of a meal, I'll tell you that much. Um, then, oh yeah, so then we harvested our garden, tons of wonderful vegetables, and uh, packed it up and we moved to the coast. And of course, once I got to the coast, I had to jump right in that crystal clear water, do a little free diving for Dungeness Crab. That garden yielded so much food. These are small eggplant, we've got cucumbers, we've got zucchinis, we've got tomatoes, big tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, butternut squash, we've got chili peppers, I mean this thing, herbs as well, we had basil, um, yeah this this garden just absolutely thrived, it was really a pleasure to to have that amount of food right in the backyard. So finally after harvesting this beautiful garden we moved back to the coast and one of the first things I did was try to locate a spot for Dungeness Crab. So there's a lot more than Dungeness Crab going on in this footage, um, but I just wanted to, you know, show you kind of what it looks like. Here's a giant red rock crab eating a baby <laughs> Dungeness Crab. And uh, I got some time to spend with this little lingcod here. He was just about legal, but I don't pull the trigger unless I know for sure that he is legal size, but really pretty cool to see. I don't know, they're just fun to hang out with. And of course he finds himself a cave. And then this was a, uh, a jellyfish. That was pretty cool to see as well. I always like just hanging out and watching them. They're so interesting. And then I started finding just absolutely massive sea urchins. You can see my hand for scale there. Um, sea urchins all over the place. And these are not those little purples. These are the big reds. Um, so it was cool to find a spot like that. You know, you can just see them here, here, here all over the bottom. Little kelp greenling. Oh no, that's a little, there's a little perch in the background there. Uh, look at all these sea urchin. Look at how big they are. Kelp greenling in the background there. So finally I couldn't resist. I had to grab one for the table. Two of them came off, but yeah, take a look at that big one. Man, that's almost the size of my head. <laughs> it's a real big urchin. And then finally, the moment we've been waiting for. Um, I only filmed one, I got six this day, but here's a nice, big, male, legal Dungeness crab. Bam! Grab him by those back legs, you can see that triangular apron down there. Very typical of the males. And I had to put the camera between my legs to film gauging, so you'll have to bear with me here. But uh, yeah, very much legal. I really didn't even need to gauge him, he was definitely over. Well, I think that pretty much brings you up to speed. That's what we were up to for the last year. We got a bunch more footage of other adventures too, but uh, I think I'm going to drop a few of those as individual videos. We got one uh, trout and morel mushrooms, some wild garlic or wild onions up in the in the mountains. Totally awesome. Such a good time. But for now, I'm signing off. So until next time, keep the old ways alive. Here's your outtakes. Just dig right in there. You gotta just grab. Say hello. Oh yes. Do <laughs> my I think one of the reasons they call them trash fish in the U.S. is because they're very tough to fillet. Oh. <laughs> I had a feeling that would Wow. Happen. It's a really tough fish.